Out of focus. Out of focus. Oh. oh, look. It's 19-year-old Char in his first-year dorm room testing out his brand new camera. He's pretty fragile. Look at him the wrong way and he'll probably shatter. Earlier this year, he realized that those weird, jealous feelings about the boys he thought were prettier than him, yeah, those were crushes. And you might say, well, that makes sense, you know, we live in this heteronormative society, it's hard to be the odd one out. Except that in my house, that's you Chicago language for a section of a dorm, there were 48 people and six gay guys. Six! If you add the bi people, gay girls, and ace folks, there were 12 queer people. That's 25%. That's a critical mass of gay. That's enough to seize the means of reproduction. In fact, one of the things I kept worrying about was that I knew so many gay people that my being gay felt like a statistical impossibility. But I still felt weird about coming out. I still felt lonely. What kind of person was I back then? Well, first off, my hair was objectively worse. I don't know whose idea the bangs were, but my hair for the first 18 years of my life was just bad. What was I like personality-wise? Kind of the same as I am now, only amplified. I liked making people feel good, I just didn't have as good a sense of how feelings worked. I sang, all the time, in front of people, at the dinner table. I loved words. I wrote my common F essay on my personal connections to the letter O. The circles we studied in calculus class, the opening to Henry V, the songs I sang as a baby to the moon. That essay was inspired by this Fachel Lindsay poem. Back then, I kind of thought I'd learn everything I needed to know from reading or from school, but the whole gay thing just wasn't coming up in any of my classes. I mean, in my first year of college, we were reading the ancient Greeks, so there was gay stuff. But the part in Plato's Symposium where one of the characters says straight couples are pregnant with babies while gay couples are pregnant with ideas just wasn't that helpful to me on a practical level. Also, apparently lesbians can't get pregnant with anything? There's just not a lot taught in school about what it's like to actually be gay or to talk about it with other people. We certainly didn't read any gay love stories, and I didn't read any queer theory until I started grad school this fall, when I read the book with maybe my favorite title ever, Jack Halberstam's The Queer Art of Failure. Was anything from my classes actually helpful? This is going to sound weird, but the most impactful reading I did around the time I came out was actually Freud. Yes, Sigmund Freud, who thought all kids have Oedipus complexes, all independent women are hysterical, and whose work confirmed a lot of people's pre-existing theories that queer people are sick. Hmm, a homosexual with depression and anxiety. Well, you've come to the right place. Let's have a look at your basement full of childhood memories and unpack all your hidden traumas. What does this kitchen set say about your stress eating behavior? Can this toy violin tell us anything about your fear of loud noises? And how about dressing up in your dad's leather hat? Did this hat make you gay? But here's the thing. Freud's overarching claim is that human development is really complicated for everyone and that in trying to live in a society, we all hide the ways we don't fit in. Freud thought our identities could be divided into three basic parts. First off, there's the ego. That's you. Hmm, that's controversial. It's the part of you that thinks and decides and worries and everything. But there are also parts of you that you can't control and can't always even recognize. They're subconscious. Like the id, which is basically a hungry little dragon that lives inside you and makes you want stuff. In my case, pod see you with tofu and gay sex. And last but not least, the superego, which is all the stuff you've internalized from your culture. Freud thought that the messages you learn growing up literally become a part of you and form a kind of security system in your head. He writes about this in Civilization and its Discontents. Civilization obtains the mastery over the dangerous love of aggression in individuals by enfeebling and disarming it, and setting up an institution within their minds to keep watch over it, like a garrison in a conquered city. Freud's theories are helpful because they show how, to some extent, everyone suppresses their desires in order to, you know, behave appropriately. But when you're part of an oppressed minority, 
sometimes that self-suppression can get out of hand. Like, when you're gay, the things you want aren't in line with heteronormativity. So even if you're not surrounded by overt homophobia, it's still something you don't want to talk about. You want to protect yourself from being too different. But that little dragon inside of you doesn't go away. You still want stuff. Your superego just makes you feel weird and wrong about it. So your desire for pleasure is in constant battle with your fear of getting ostracized or hurt or killed. Freud calls this fear the death instinct. In every individual, the two trends, one towards personal happiness and the other towards unity with the rest of humanity, must contend with each other. So must the two processes of individual and of cultural development oppose each other and dispute the ground against each other. As a closeted kid reading this, I felt like I'd found a way to describe a feeling I didn't even know how to name. I needed something to keep me company on those long nights where I'd keep trying to psych myself up to go down the hall and knock on my gay housemate's door and come out to him, and it would get later and later and finally I'd just give up and go to bed. I needed something to help me feel less alone. And of course, that thing was Troy, Savon, and Tyler Oakley painting each other's faces. Yes, nothing made me feel loved and accepted quite like two gay boys wrapped in an oversized t-shirt with Tyler smearing blue paint all over Troy's face. Okay, I wasn't actually all that comforted by 2014 era collab videos, but Troy Savon's coming out video helped a lot. Queer people are gonna roll their eyes at how obvious this is, but if you've never come out, you might not know that there are literally thousands of coming out videos on YouTube. They're usually unscripted, just a person talking to their camera. They often start out with an official coming out, like, On August 7th, 2010, I told my family that I am gay. And now on August 7th, 2013, I want you guys to know that I'm gay. And then they tell the story of how they came out to their friends and family. When I was in the closet, I watched dozens of these videos every day. Although the actual words, I'm gay, felt so powerful to me that I often had to skip over that first part. One really cool thing about coming out videos is just how many people are making them. 12 year olds and dads with teenage kids, people from every race, religion, every gender. I have to confess that most of the coming out videos I watched back in 2014 were from white cisgender gay boys. I'm a little ashamed of that looking back, but I realized that I wanted to hear from people who look like me and maybe grew up in a similar way. So I will never begrudge people who look up a specifically black coming out story or a specifically Mormon coming out story or, of course, a specifically bi or non-binary coming out story. Troy's coming out video is a great example of what these videos tend to look like. Troy is using a nice camera and he does use jump cuts, but he's in his bedroom unscripted, which is the important part. Most of the coming out videos I've seen are unedited, and almost all have been off the cuff. The end product is something that feels raw and emotionally honest, and not trying to be impressive. In Troy's video, you can see he didn't neaten up his dresser drawers. Another thing about these coming out videos, there's no coming out that ever goes quite to plan. There's no way to do it that's dignified in any traditional sense of the word. Like, here's what Troy says about coming out to his dad. And I don't know if this only happened to me, um, anyone else who has had to come out or say something really nerve-wracking, let me know if this happened to you as well. But I felt a literal physical locking of my throat, and I couldn't speak. So I went, because dad... I'm gay. I just remember him kind of looking over at me and starting to kind of bawl his eyes out. I also bawled my eyes out. We hugged and I asked him, I was like, Dad, do you still love me? And he looked at me like I was absolutely crazy and said, yes, of course I still love you. There's just a lot of crying in Troy's video in general, even though his family and friends are completely supportive. Of course, there are other coming out videos where people get hurt. I didn't see too many videos of kids who got kicked out of their house for being queer, though that happens a lot. But I saw Barry, who came out when he was 50 and had to divorce his wife. But removing that no divorce rule from my body was excruciating. Or Jack, who faced some frustrating religious conflict with his Catholic dad. My dad don't really talk about it at all. Apparently he's brought it up to my mom a couple times, thinking now I should become a priest. 
Whether or not people are supportive, there's just so many ways a coming out can go wrong. There are a lot of people who just couldn't get the words out and had to make people guess. And I basically sat her down at the kitchen table and texted her and I said, Mom, I need to tell you something really important, but it's not bad, but it's not good. And she's sitting there, she's like, why are you texting me and what is this about? And first she's like, oh my god, did you do drugs? And I'm like, no, Mom. If I had read The Queer Art of Failure by Jack Halberstam, I would have known that failure is an intrinsic part of being gay, when success in our culture is defined by capitalism and heteronormativity. But as Halberstam explains, that puts queer people in a unique position to fail in interesting ways. Under certain circumstances, failing, losing, forgetting, unmaking, undoing, unbecoming, not knowing, may in fact offer more creative, more cooperative, more surprising ways of being in the world. For me, all the failure in these videos was helpful. It showed me that my coming out would be awkward, and that that was okay. It showed me that there was life after the awkwardness, that someday my coming out would make a good story, maybe even a story that would help people. Oh hi. Welcome to the library, where my parents keep all their books that make the best in-your-pants jokes, including Contemplating Adultery, The Secret Life of a Victorian Woman in Your Pants. So remember the death instinct Freud was talking about? That fear of getting hurt that makes us hold in our desires? Well, 25 years after Freud wrote Civilization and Its Discontents, a German philosopher named Herbert Marcuse started thinking about what Freud's ideas actually meant for, you know, the way we organize society. Marcuse suggested the death instinct could be replaced by something he calls a life instinct. In Eros and Civilization, he wonders what would happen if we all reorganized our lives around naming and, responsibly, seeking our desires. No longer used as a full-time instrument of labor, the body would be resexualized. The body in its entirety would become an object of cathexis, a thing to be enjoyed, an instrument of pleasure. I was pretty repressed at the time I first read this, but even I thought, um, this feels kind of gay. As I was researching this video, I discovered that I'm not the only one. Gay rights activist Jeffrey Escoffier credits Marcusa with inspiring a lot of early gay liberation activists in the 1960s, and Gerald Moldenhauer, another activist, criticized Marcusa for not mentioning gay people specifically. For me, it was springtime when I read this, and all the trees were blossoming, and I was outside in my dorm room courtyard, and it started to feel like this whole life instinct would involve all the cute boys in my life just getting over themselves and cuddling with me. And that is actually still true. I am currently uh, looking for more people to cuddle with. If you are a cute boy or non-binary person interested in the role, send me an email with your resume and cover letter at whatsbehindthesky at gmail.com. Applications from women will also be accepted as long as you vote. The point is, there's a lot of wishing that goes into being closeted. And at the time, my wish fulfillment came from one particular gay short film. Now, I should acknowledge there are a lot of gay-themed short films on YouTube, and most are, well, they're not exactly pulling in A-list actors, you know, low budgets, no high concept ideas. What I'm trying to say is they're bad. You know, they're just all the same. It's like, how many movies can you make about gay boys at a British prep school getting beaten up and feeling sad? And then of course there's that classic about what would happen if straight people were the oppressed minority and gay people were the bigots, and of course the gays in that universe are just as bigoted, and you know, I'm not even gonna get into that one. I'm, I'm not. The film I was obsessed with is called Shabbat Dinner. It's got a few audio issues here and there, and the actors are not quite the right ages, but for the most part the writing is good. It's about two teenage boys, William and Virgo, who meet when William's parents invite Virgo's parents over for Shabbat dinner. While the parents argue about the true meaning of Judaism, William takes Virgo to his room, and that's where things get interesting. Yeah, I can keep a secret. Promise you won't be upset. Yeah, sure. Well, the thing is, um, I'm gay. What? Nothing. 
Never mind. I shouldn't have said. What did you say? Uh, didn't you hear what I just said? Is it true? The film is mainly about two characters who are brave enough to ask for what they want. William asks Virgo for help with questions that have been bothering him. How did you know you were gay? And Virgo asks for a different kind of validation. Do you want to hook up? Wow. Dude, you've got balls to ask that. What if I kicked your ass? <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Um. I shouldn't have asked that. I'm not gay. No, it's okay. Um. Do you want to play trivia? How should I say this? Uh, William is cute, definitely cute enough for 19 year old me to have a little crush on him, but we're not talking about Love Simon here. He and Virgo look like regular kids. It was really helpful for me to see that sex didn't just happen between unnaturally hot people, and that fear and shame about sex are things you can work through. This film was also great for me, partly because it didn't take itself too seriously. <laughs> oh, your son seems like such a nice boy. Maybe he'll rub off on William. <laughs> This is so cool. Sex can be awkward, goofy, and ridiculous, and learning that was a big relief for 19-year-old me. Look, man, I'm not... I'm not gay. <laughs> Write down your number. So, how did my coming out go? Well, in May and June of 2014, I finally came out to my housemates and some of my close friends. Their reactions were almost disappointingly low-key. I think some of them knew already. That summer, I went home to Cincinnati and I finally got up the courage to come out to my mom. She was fine, a little surprised, but she barely had time to react because the next day we had to get on a plane and fly to Seattle to visit my cousins. We were wandering around downtown Seattle and we accidentally wound up in the middle of Pride. And being mostly closeted in the middle of Pride is just awful. As the floats full of built men wearing nothing but turquoise underwear went by, I saw a man off to the side holding up a sign that said, God is not mad at you. And I literally heard the voice of God in my head saying, no, I I'm not mad. No, really, I'm not mad. So then I decided to come out to the rest of my family. And after asking if I was sure, they were great about it. Although my dad did tell me he didn't want to see me in a pride parade wearing nothing but an electric blue thong. I told him I would wear a tutu instead, and he was good with that. My point here is that I got a lot of support when I finally came out, but I still needed the stuff I found on YouTube. Those coming out stories and even some of the short films were a source of knowledge for me, in the same way as Freud or Marcusa, or later on, the queer art of failure. <laughs> Theories about society were helpful, but when I was coming out, I also needed the first-hand experiences of those who'd come before me. I hope some diligent historian will archive all these videos so that we can all look back on what it was like to come out in the 20-teens. In grad school this quarter, I read an essay by Eve Sedgwick, one of the founders of queer theory. A lot of queer critics start their writings with observations from their own lives. Sedgwick thinks that's because, for queer people, the act of reading is often a desperate search for personal connection. It seems to me that an often quiet but very palpable presiding image here is the interpretive absorption of the child or adolescent whose sense of personal queerness may or may not yet have resolved into a sexual specificity of prescribed object choice, aim, sight, or identification. Such a child is reading for important news about herself without knowing what form that news will take, with only the patchiest familiarity with its codes, without even more than hungrily hypothesizing 
to what questions this news may proffer an answer. It's funny, that Eve Sedgwick quote comes from an essay about paranoia. Sedgwick argues there's something paranoid in a lot of queer criticism, because there's a lot of fear and self-policing that goes into being queer. I wish Sedgwick were alive today so that she could watch all those coming out videos on YouTube and see people turn that fear into hope. I know that when I finally came out, I felt not scared, but kind of overexposed. This secret that I'd been keeping for so long was finally out, and it felt like people could see right through me. I felt naked. That was more than six years ago. I was 19 then, and I just turned 26. But there are still times when being gay and carrying all the associations that go with it just feels weird. That's why I wanted to end this video with one more piece of gay media I found back in 2014. There's this other type of coming out video that's not a coming out story, but an actual live coming out, usually to a parent. I didn't watch a lot of these videos back in 2014, not for any moral reason, but just because actually seeing the thing I was too afraid to do play out before my very eyes was too scary. But there's this one live coming out video that I did watch, and to this day, I can't get it out of my head. It's this boy named George coming out to his grandmother over the phone. He's alone in his room with his family watching TV downstairs. I don't know anything about him. This is the only video on his channel, but this kid is obviously much younger than me when I came out. His grandmother gets major points for carrying the conversation. George is clearly nervous and also, you know, a teenager. I'm just going to have my drink of Ovaltine. Oh, I'm going to have my two ginger ale with But then, finally... I'm gay. Pardon? What did you say? I'm gay. You're gay? Oh, that's all right. Lots of nice people are gay. Wherever George's grandmother is, I wish she knew that when I have those moments where being gay just feels weird, I hear her in my head saying, Well, that's all right. A lot of nice people are gay. And... It gives me a moment to breathe. I don't regret coming out. Not for one second. Since I first came out, friends of mine who used to be homophobic have told me I helped change their minds. I once found myself in a dorm room full of straight boys who wanted to listen to my story and ask questions. Queer friends have been comfortable enough to come out to me. Coming out is the closest thing I have to a superpower. But if coming out is a superpower, it's powered by affirmations from friends and strangers on the internet and maybe even a few kind grandmothers along the way. One more thing. I've decided to take this channel in a more professional direction, so I have decided to start a Patreon. It's kind of like public radio in the United States. You can pledge a monthly donation to support my video making, if you have money, and you want to. My videos, of course, will always remain free for everyone. Take care, everybody, and I'll talk to you again soon.